Welcome, everybody. My name is Tina Wadowski, and I'm a professor in animal biosciences and director of the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare. And I welcome you here today for um, a special Campbell Center seminar. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Case. Wait. Schapens. Very good. Okay. <laughs> um, and Case is um, from the Netherlands. He has his DVM and a PhD from Wageningen where he studied with Martin Verstegen. So um, he's an old friend of many that are around here. Um, he's a 19th generation farmer from the Netherlands. Um, but he's been, he, and he's spent all his life in pigs. Um, he's worked for a uh, pig improvement company. He currently raises and markets specialty pigs and pork, um, including organic, um, and has had, uh, and is well known for the uh, Pig Signals book that he's going to tell you about in training. Um, I've discovered today that we actually go back a long way, which we never knew that we realized we'd met, but he was at Illinois at the same time I was there in graduate school, so I can say we go back a long way. Yeah, um, sure. But anyway, join me in welcoming uh, Case today. For Thank you. Thank you very much for Tina for, oh, wait a second, okay. something fell down. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, give a small talk at your university. As already told, I'm Kees Schepens. I'm my, my, my funny name is the Pig Whisperer, which was given to me in Germany by some people. And when that name sticks to you, you never lose it anymore. Uh, Tina already told, 19th generation, I'm living in the same town as my first known ancestor did in 1301 and uh, yeah it, it looks as if we have never traveled but we we really did and my sister who is in the room I don't know where oh there you are uh, she is farming now a dairy farm in Woodstock Ontario so um, domestication of pigs took place around 9,000 years ago in two areas at the same time that is in Europe and that is in China, as you can see on this map. And uh, this is the Netherlands, which is only a, a country of about 150 kilometers wide and 300 kilometers high. And in that country, I live right in the spot of where the pigs are. And this radius, which I drew on this map, is about 50 kilometer radius. And in that radius, you, you tell me how many pigs there are. You can be one million off. <laughs> there are five million pigs in this 50 kilometer radius. So if we talk about domestication of pigs and where they really survived, then it is in that part of Europe. There is not one uh, spot in the world where the pigs are more dense than in this province where I live right in the middle. So I live in between my pigs, but I live in between many other pigs too. Pigs are very intelligent, and which place would you uh, put the pigs on? The first are the chimpanzees. The chimpanzees, which in Japan are living, and that's a picture of one of them, they can uh, remember the numbers on the, on the, on the screen within 0.4 seconds. Not one single human, whether Canadian or Dutch, can repeat that. <laughs> The dolphins are very clever too, and there are dolphins who uh, only meet each other every 25 years and still know that that individual is that individual. Many uh, humans have a lot of difficulty with that. Uh, the crows uh, are known to be very clever. They like to eat walnuts, and one of, the, one of those uh, crows in Japan again learned how to drop the walnut on the pedestrian crossing so the cars would uh, crush the walnut, but not crush the crow when the crow would walk on the pedestrian crossing when the light was green, of course. So uh, the most positive list I could find, the pig is on number four. But I have to tell you, in agriculture, there is not one species more clever than a pig is. So. 
That's, I think, the reason George Orwell, in his famous book Animal Farm, let the pigs take over the farm. And the pigs were lo like humans in the end. They walked on two legs and they said all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. So, here we go. I wrote the book Pig Signals and it's a concept in the meantime where I take the animal as the starting point, the pig as the starting point. Uh, the natural species specific behavior is to me the most important thing we should give to the pigs because a pig likes to be a pig and a human likes to be a human. I travel quite a lot, especially in Europe, and in the meantime I've had some 20,000 pig farmers in my audience. Yes, there are that many still. And uh, I do a lot of trainings on farm, which means that I go with groups of veterinarians, farm advisors, farmers themselves into farms and use my checklists to check what kind of behaviors we find which could be on improved upon. I wrote four books and I do so-called train the trainer courses so if you would like to become a trainer then just let me know. The biggest problem we have I think on farms not only uh, pig farms but also on dairy farms that is that we are unconsciously blinded by the routines we walk around like we are blind and we don't see it anymore. And when you don't see it anymore, you cannot improve upon the situation. That's nice when that's unconsciously, but when you're consciously blinded by the routine, routines, then it's very difficult to give any advice to those kind of farmers. Most times those are the farmers where you drink a cup of coffee and then you leave again. Consciously animal-oriented, that is what I'm striving for. And in the meantime, after all those years, Tina, since 1986, I am unconsciously animal-oriented. The pig signal principles are very simple. And that is that you first have to look. Look and don't start thinking already. Just look what you see, write it down, and then afterwards, start thinking and maybe acting and it has to go from uh-huh to aha uh -huh. now I know and I've got some aha uh -huh experiences to share with you intelligent but also very good in parental skills I'm not talking the male side of parental skills because the boar is not present, I can tell you. But here you see one of my Berkshire Littles. And they are very good at mothering, those Berkshires. They are not very fertile, but they are very good mothers. Here you have a white sow. And in Europe and also in your country, in the meantime, we are not surprised anymore when there are 16, 18 or more piglets in just one litter. And that might be a bit of a problem. It could be a bit of a problem. As you see here, this graph comes from the Netherlands. And you can see here the, uh, the weight of the piglets in grams. And you are in the metric system, so you know exactly what that means, I think. Um, but please have a look at the 16 to 17 piglets graph. And there you see that 22%, the blue uh, bar, you see that 22% of the piglets is below 1,000 grams. How many percent of those piglets normally do survive? That will be about half of them. So 50% of those piglets normally die. So that means already a mortality rate uh, before weaning of 10%. This is, I think, something to improve upon. Uh huh. <coughs> what are the signs here? The signs are qu quite strong signs. Uh, do you have a pointer by coincidence? Oh, it doesn't work, eh? The signs are quite strong. 
because what you can see is the brown meconium, the brown meconium, the brown slime on the piglet, which is an indication that the birth process has taken too long or whether the farmer has, for example, injected too much oxytocin. So the pig gets squeezed in the birth canal and when it gets squeezed in the birth canal it gets the feeling of asphyxiation and when you get the feeling of asphyxiation you defecate. So this piglet, the, 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 the color of the mucus is already a sign of stress. Another not so very good sign is that the pig is in a dog sitting position. A dog sitting position is always a sign in pigs that they are not okay. So even finishing pigs, even sows in a dog sitting position need to be taken care of. So this piglet is also showing that. Another very important sign is the uh, retracted ears. Yeah, and the retracted ears is also a sign of not being in a very good physical state. And I will tell you why. Because please have a look at these uh, two uh, pig heads. Uh, the left one is the normal one. That's the normal piglet. And also you see that the ears are to, uh, pointing towards the front. They are not retracted, but they are standing upright. That is the normal shape of a pig head. <coughs> on the right, I already used the dolphins as an example, but here on the right you see the dolphin heads. And the dolphin heads are piglets which have been suffering from intrauterine growth restriction. So the inter intrauterine growth restriction results in a brain which is the size of a normal piglet because that is where all the nutritional uh, stuff goes to but the rest of the body has not grown as much and there they uh, that's why the ears are to the back and that's why it is a dolphin shaped head is that an Im important thing to look for yes because we know uh, that the piglets with that severe intrauterine growth restriction are the piglets that are not taking in enough colostrum. Having been on a dairy farm the last few days, I saw how important colostrum is for calves, but also for piglets, colostrum is, a, is the only source for uh, immune protection. So we need to make sure that every piglet gets its share of colostrum. You know how much? How much would you see as a normal amount of colostrum in calves? Two liters? Four liters? Whatever. I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> but in piglets, it needs to be 250 mLs. So a piglet needs to ingest around 250 mLs colostrum for, a, for an optimal immune protection. So how can you do that? I want to show you. This is a way to do it. But then you need a lot of labor. And in Europe, for example, in our part of Europe, that labor very often comes from Eastern Europe, from people who are, yeah, let's say, not too lazy to work. Um, if you don't have the labor, there's another way to do it. Because, oh, sorry, let me check. Here we go again. There's another way to, to, to make sure that those piglets, those little piglets with those dolphin heads, which are the most uh, vulnerable piglets in a litter, still can get their colostrum, and that is to make sure that the sow is calm. To make sure that after farrowing, the sow is lying on her side with her legs stretched so that the piglets can drink as much colostrum as they want. 
the milk is floating, the colostrum is floating all the time. So you don't have to worry about that. You have to worry about the fact that the sow needs to be calm. Some farmers, they would use stress nil to inject the sow after farrowing has completed to make sure that she stays calm for about six to eight hours. But that's a pharmaceutical approach. If you are able as a farmer or a farm advisor to make sure that those sows are calm, that would be a better way. To minimize the piglets below 1000 grams, there is a little trick, I call it. And that is that you supplement the sows between weaning and mating for five to seven days with dextrose. And dextrose, 200 grams a day, between weaning and mating, and in first parity sows, which means gilts, yeah, that are to be mated, you have to do it one week. Yeah, you give, every day, you give them 200 grams of dextrose. This dextrose will cause an insulin peak, and that insulin peak will make sure that also the fertility gonadotrophic hormones will increase too, and you get better sized follicles, and you get more even sized follicles, and that will make sure that the number of piglets below uh, 1000 gram will drop around 3 to 5 percent. In this research, which is a bit old research, it was 3 percent. This helps in making those piglets survive better. Babies are real stayers. They stay in their cribs yeah, up till a year. I'm a grandfather now, so I, I don't know exactly anymore. But pigs are real fleers. They flee the nest and they search for whatever they can find. And that is a very strong behavior which we need to stimulate as much as possible. Sometimes they are stressed out. Yes, for sure. Pigs can get stressed out too. And here you see a group of pigs stressed out, many of them in dark sitting position or with an arched back, which is also a very typical sign of I need more attention and look for lamenesses and look for other things. But dark sitting position is very important. Chromodacrio rea. Now, that is a word. I never learned it at my vet school in Holland, but you might teach it here, Tina. For sure, we only know, not for so long time, we knew it from uh, uh, rabbits, we knew it from rats, that when they get stressed out, they get those bloody tears. But also in pigs, we know that when you stress the pig, they will get bloody tears. And the bloody tears research I have seen and I have read very often is also linked to tail biting, which is funny. So we are talking here about a sign on a pig which has to be interpreted as a sign of stress. Because the Harderian gland, which is on the other side of the eyelid, will only produce this uh, porphyrin like a substance when the pig is stressed out or when its health status is not so good. But I would also consider that as a stress. So look at the eyes of a pig and yes, pigs can cry. Yeah, because this is a tear, they can cry. This picture I took on a farm in Germany with massive health problems. And I was amazed by the number of pigs with those tears. Then I didn't know what it meant, because also a pig whisperer has to learn all the time. Uh, but now I know that this was a sign of real distress. I al already mentioned tail biting. In the European Union, tail docking is already forbidden since 19, I say 19, uh, since 1998. 
up till now there are only two or three countries like Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, which is not part of the European Union, who are not tail docking. All the other countries are still tail docking. So there is an issue. There is an issue coming up from society. Hey guys, why are you still tail docking? And they are right, I have to say. They are right. Because we as intelligent people, we need to be more intelligent than pigs to find out ways how to prevent tail biting. Because again, tail biting in scientific words, it's redirected explorative behavior, redirection of exploration. So what can we do about it in existing barns? Because your existing barns are more or less the same as ours, with slatted floors, with concrete walls. We need to do something in those environments because not one farmer in Canada, I think, or in the Netherlands or in Europe has the money to build a palace for the pigs. That's not possible. So I'll give you a few ways to do it. First I show you which, in which area you have to look when the pigs are starting to bite tails because normally pigs like the peas and the peas means sleeping about 18 to 20 hours a day. That is why pigs are as lazy as they are. They really like to sleep. So then everything is in the green, as I say. But sometimes there is aggression, and fighting in pigs is fighting with their heads. They give each other head knocks, and they will hit each other with the head. They will have the mouth open, so they will bite. So you will have wounds here, wounds on the shoulder, wounds in the neck. So that's aggression. On the other side, you have the passive pigs. And the passive pigs, I already showed you, they have the dog sitting position. And they are like some humans are, oh, I wait for the stress is over. Huh. I'm going to sit in the corner, just wait until everything's settled again, and then I'll return. So those pigs are the passive pigs. Here you see extreme exploration, and extreme exploration is a sign, one of the signs of extreme exploration is tail biting. And tail biting events are always in some pens, not in a farm. All of the pigs in all pens will start tail biting, it's only a few pens. And here I have a research from Johan Zonderland, Dutch guy, and here on the right you see the pens without tail biting, which were 76. And the pens with tail biting you see are only 20. In the pens without tail biting, you see there are some pigs developing bite marks. So they have bitten the tails and eaten, maybe picked off a few hairs, but there is no wounds, so there's no blood. And that's very important, because when there is blood, there is a wound, there is blood, and pigs like blood. They like to just ingest a little bit of blood. They love to, to, to lick on it, to nibble a little bit on it. So here you see there is many pens without tail biting, a few wounds on the tail, but only below 2% of the pigs. So 2 out of 100 pigs have a wound on the tail. In the pens with tail biting, it's a totally different story. Look here. You see the bite marks, they rise to almost 10% of the pigs. And you see too, after a lag time of about you know, 10, 15 days, you see that those bite marks start to work out in wounds. And those wounds, they increase also to even higher level of about 12%. So here you see that there is some time between seeing the bite marks and before the wounds are there, you have time to intervene. So it is not that from one day on the other there is tail, tail biting all of a sudden. It is a gradual process where you can intervene. How would you do the intervention? 
I could say, okay, I have to um, take out the biters and I have to uh, take out the bitten pigs, but then you are already too late. What you could do is the following. What is this? Uh huh. Who knows? This is burlap bags. I didn't know the word burlap. I'm sorry, but my nephew helped me in our case. It's not jute, which we use in Holland. It's burlap. So the burlap bags, which is very cheap, very cheap. It hardly costs, maybe, I don't know what it would cost in, in Canada, but I think a dollar or maybe two dollars. If you hang them in the pens, the pigs will start playing with them. They are curious animals. They are intelligent animals. So give them the opportunity to just destroy, pull, bite, eat, uh, use their noses, use their beaks, and let them play with the jute, jute zak, the burlap bag. And what you see on below the graph, the burlap bags will have tail biting and ear biting, and you will have around five times less pigs with tail wounds at 14 weeks of age. You can't stop it all, but you can already minimize it a lot. Humans have three ways to cope with stress, and that is to fight, to flight, or to freeze. Pigs have exactly the same. Pigs do the same. Yeah, and my cows too, because they flew. I don't know where or why, but... And freezing in pigs, I would like to show you in a little... Um, I hope it works. But this pigs, I stress because I put it on my back. And I think this film gave me the name Pig Whisperer. Have a look. Oh, sorry. Oh, it doesn't continue. But I can put my hands off. Because when that pig is stressed, and it shows this freezing reaction, in chickens you will have the same. They will lie on their back, and they will stay lying on their back. I had a piglet who stayed on its back for more than 10 minutes. It didn't move because, oh, 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 what happens? I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. So you see the heart rate, pounding heart, and then after some time they will turn around and they will move. Is it important to know? Yes, because that is one of the ways that pigs have a certain personality. They know how uh, Every human has the same. So they are more similar than we sometimes think. I have a video, which is my video of my PhD study, which was in 1991 I did my PhD. So video then was something very special. Uh, but I, I, can't, I can't refuse you to watch it, because what I did I stressed out the pigs with cold air, which you have a lot of. Um, I stressed them out with cold air, and that cold air totally changed the behavior of the pigs. And I can show you the fighting, the fleeing, and the freezing in this video. So please have a look. This was the air-conditioned room. Here we made the cold air with, with these ventilators. About five hours a day, we, we in an unpredictable way, we, uh, we stressed them out with cold air. Fully air-conditioned, <coughs> so very expensive. This is the control group, the controller afdeling. So in the control group, you see the relaxed uh, attitude of the pigs. Yeah, they are lying down on their sides with the legs stretched they feel pretty okay. There is nothing uh, wrong there. Some pigs uh, are in a dog sitting position, but he knows it's wrong, so we'll, he will stand up now. Thank you. Stand up, please. Thank you. 
And um, here you see them uh, lying like uh, spoony spoony, we call it. <laughs> yeah? Spoony spoony, they are lying next to each other. And then we have the, the, the this is still the control group. Now this is the experimental group. And there was still not any cold air. We gave them uh, uh, back numbers so we could uh, register their behavior. And it's all published in... Uh, in uh, etology and behavior, I, th I think. So here you see them. They are a little bit uh, more inquisitive. They are uh, walking around. But still you can see they are pretty much OK. They are lying down, not that much on their side as in the control group. And now the cold air starts. Look at them. Yeah, It looks as if they are playing, but they are actually yeah, they are stressed out. You see some of them stand in the corner, in the back. Yeah, but most of them will move around and they will uh, start fighting with each other. And that fighting uh, results in the end, it results in a lot of uh, ear biting in this case. Um, and just have a look here. Ear biting, giving each other head knocks. And that head knocking in the end results in wounds. So this is a sign that those pigs, and this experiment lasted for 10 weeks, even after ear biting, even after 10 weeks, they were not showing any uh, diminishing of this abnormal behavior. So pigs will never get used to cold air. So in your country, make sure pigs are not stressed out by cold air because they actually have very great difficulty coping with it. As you can see here, now they are lying down, they get a bit cold, and now they are lying down, they, are, they lie on their sternum, yeah, so on their belly, on their sternum, so that's also a sign that they are not fully uh, okay here, you see, they're still biting, and now there is no cold air anymore. It is the one hour with cold air or the one and a half hour with cold air. We try to mimic the, the practical situation on farm. You see that they are still uh, not very well. They show huddling behavior, which, which is another sign of not feeling well. And um, there I say, don't stress pigs out with cold air because you will have a lot of biting in this situation. Oh. Another stress moment in the life of pigs is pigs are lazy and when they are active the first thing they will do is drink and eat. So if they can't eat at the right time. They are social animals. They like to do it all on the same time. You get this kind of videos, which uh, is uh, stressing. You hear it by the sounds they are producing. Can you hear it, by the way? Yeah. You hear it by the sound they are producing, and you hear it by the behavior. Some are real acrobats trying to dive in, literally, trying to dive in to get their share of meal. And uh, I, it took me about two years to convince the farmer that this feeding system was not his. Because every time I came there and he was feeding, the pigs were showing this uh, behavior. And uh, it's a shame, but if I would have turned the camera a bit to the right, you would have seen that a lot of piglets were standing there at the wall waiting for their time to get the feed. And when we did the, the post-mortem, many of them already had ulcers in their stomachs. So another sign of stress. Intelligent, I hope you are already convinced a little bit that they are. Social, yes. Pigs recognize each other by sight, but even more, they recognize each other by smell, like we humans do.
because when you are lying in bed and it's not your wife in your bed, you will smell it. <laughs> um, social also because they like to stay together as a litter. In nature, the litter is the natural group of animals. Normally, they will not move away, with exception again of the males, uh, but normally they will stay together. And when they stay together, there is a lot of advantages on the behavioral side. So on the behavioral side, in this group of piglets, which you can see is a farrowing um, pen, but in the farrowing pen, the sow is absent because the sow is already weaned from the pigs and not the pigs from the sow. The pigs stay in this pen. We call it a so-called kram opfokhok. So that is a uh, farrowing, uh, um, growing pen. So in this pen, the piglets will stay for around 10 weeks, from birth till about 8 to 10 weeks. And Tina, on the farm you were, Gerbert, in the Netherlands, he uses this system. Sorry? Yeah, you, you can lift them. Yeah, it flips them up. Because when a pig is weaned, yeah, it's the same as when you wean a calf. You can wean a calf from the cow, but it will lose the milk and it will lose the mother. That is a double stress. So you now have the quiet wean. I will take them home for my cows, but you have them here in Canada. You have, to have the quiet wean nose rings. Uh, and that is a very nice invention because then you only take away the milk and not the cow. So here with piglets, you will have, uh, when you take them away out of the farrowing crate, they will have a new pen. They will most times will have a new drinking system. They will have a new feeding system. And when you mix them, they will also have new mates, new friends, which are not friends in the 20, first 24 hours, but they are really someone to fight with to get the social order in place. So I'm a big advocate of keeping litters together as much as possible. But keep the litters together from a behavioral point of view, but also from a health point of view. Because when you start mixing piglets after weaning, you also start mixing bacteria. You start mixing viruses you start mixing piglets with different health statuses. Because one sow will carry an APP uh, germ or a streptococcal germ, and another sow will not. So you will start mixing piglets which have different health statuses right after weaning with all the other stress factors we already have. So please keep the litters together, because when you do, the transmission of diseases will be a lot less, as you can see in this slide. Pigs are intelligent, but uh, living in the Netherlands, with that five million pigs around me in a radius of 50 kilometers, there's also about four million pigs in that same circle. Four million pigs. So you can imagine that in our country, pig barns need to wash the exhaust air to take the smell out, to take the ammonia out. And we are doing that with so-called air washers. As you can see there uh, on, the, uh, on the farm, you see smoke coming out because many of those air washers start burning. And when they start burning, then you have a fire which is so enormous that all the pigs in that barn will die. But why does ammonia happen? It only happens because we were stupid around 1960. We were stupid enough to make slatted floors. And those slatted floors were the way to industrialize pig farming. Because when you have slatted floors, all the feces all the urine will be put into a pit. 
and that pit is below the slatted floors. When urine and feces come together, as you can see here, ureum in the urine, urease in the fecal bacteria, will produce ammonia. So, living in a little village in the Netherlands where two huge barn fires happened, I said to myself, hey Case, this is a little bit stupid, like our queen said to our king when he made a funny remark. This is a beetje dom, a little bit stupid. So, a little bit stupid means that we need to be so clever, oh, I will come back to that. It, it, for sure we have an animal welfare issue here, because as you can see here, this is all concrete. So, and the s floors are also slatted concrete floors. In the Netherlands we have a lot of humans, a lot of industry, a lot of agriculture. And agriculture by far is the biggest uh, ammonia emitter. So 93% of the ammonia emissions around the EU are coming from farms. And here you see one of those enormous barn fires. The fire engines are there, but they can't do anything. They just have to wait until the fire goes out from itself, and they have to make sure that there are no human people, humans injured or houses burned down. So I find it I found it a challenge for myself, being an academic, being a farmer, to find a solution for this problem, and I did. Because I know that pigs are intelligent, I know that they are clean by themselves, it's the only farm animal which is clean by itself. I have to say sorry to my sister, but cows, they shit everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, so, and you get, I, that's why I became a pig vet, because I didn't like to, all the, yeah, the feces on your trousers and, I th and in pig farms you can shower in and out, nice. Um, so pigs are clean, and uh, I try to be empathetic towards pigs, and then they might be a little bit empathetic towards me, so I thought, okay, if I know that they are hygienic, clean by themselves. Can I not pimp it a little bit? Yeah, do the stage two. So I knew this chemical reaction, which is a very old known chemical reaction. So I thought, okay, when I separate manure feces from urine, there might be no ammonia. So, yeah, I thought, okay, let's go for it. Separate it right at the source. And I thought, okay, when I'm empathetic, I have to reward the pig. So rewarding, conditioning, yeah, positive reinforcement, you can all use scientific terms for it, but just rewarding with lemon candies was the trick. <laughs> lemon candies. And why lemon candies? Because they can smell them, they can hear them when they are chewed by another pig, they can uh, um, feel them, and they can digest them. So I thought, let's try that one. And here it is in this graph, you can see it a poupoir on the <coughs> right side, an urinoir at the left side, and that's what I got patented to. I was the first crazy guy in the world who ever offered a pig a urinoir. We men know what a urinoir is. You women only can see that and know that when you have sneaked into the men's <laughs> toilet. <laughs> this is my uh, setup on my farm in in Orschot in the Netherlands. I work together with the vet school of Hanover, Germany, 
which uh, I have a PhD uh, student who is now on my farm doing the research. We have 12 cameras hanging there, so we uh, observe them from all different sites. So it's not a private toilet, it's a very public toilet. And uh, I'll show you a little bit how it works when the video runs, but it will. Have a look. This is one of the cameras. On the left, the poupoir. On the right, the urinoir. And in the urinoir, that's where the pigs drink. And when the pigs drink, you many times evoke a, a urination reflex. Because in the old people's home, you do the same. You open, you do the tap. Yeah? When grandpa is there with his big prostrate, yeah, you open the tap and he will start dripping. So here, the same with the pigs. When the pig is, and now he got a reward. I was uh, making too much funny words. So it has already urinated, and when the urination is there, then it gets automatically rewarded through a sensor technique with a candy. And in this way, I, um, in this way I'm doing it now with groups of eight. And uh, next week I will go to Eastern Germany and we will see whether we can also start a setup with larger groups of 20, 25 pigs in a group because it works with small numbers, but we have to make it work with larger numbers. And then I think in 25 years, all of the world will be using this system because you can use the, the urim, urine as a source of ureum. You don't have to purchase this from a urea factory and you can use the solid feces for your gardens. I hope. So, um, who is more intelligent? Are we or are the pigs? I try to be more intelligent than my pigs. As lazy as a pig, yeah, everybody's got the t-shirt already, I hope. Yeah? Um, we people very often working like crazy. You do that here, we do that in the Netherlands, we get the burnouts. Now the pigs very often get the sunburns, yeah, which is, I think, more, uh, more clever than what we do in our lives. But they, bring, uh, they let the food bring, they let the water bring. And here you can see they take the mud baths, and that's the reason pigs are very often seen as the dirty animal. But pigs cannot sweat, so they need another way to get rid of their excessive heat. And that's why they take their mud baths when they are able to do that. On my farm they can, and they do it very often. Last summer, which was extremely hot for, for Dutch circumstances, I had to use 1,000 liters of water every day to cool them down, because it was extremely hot. Their senses are pretty good, with the exception of the eyes. The eyes are only uh, dichromatic, not trichromatic like in humans, so they don't see the same color uh, spectrum as what we do. And also they have their eyes directed towards the floor, so they lo love to um, uh, look at the floor, so very often when there are little th things on the floor and you are moving pigs, make sure you remove all lo those little things before you can uh, move the pigs in an easy way. So you need to take account of that. The nose, uh, sorry, the, the eyes are also very important because only through sight they can find their feeding places. So after weaning, you need to make sure that the pigs are able to see where the feeding spot is. They cannot smell it out, they have to see it out. So keep the light on during the night. In Europe, very often, they will switch off the light and that will not make it easier for a pig to be weaned. The nose is also very good in finding truffles. Um, the, the Italians know that, but they, have actually not, they are actually not giving any permission anymore for people to search for truffles with sows because they are too good at finding truffles. You know why? Because the scent of truffles is exactly the same as the scent of a boar. So a sow in heat is the best animal to find truffles. So they forbade it. 
Yeah? Don't search truffles with pigs. Only with dogs. The nose of a pig is about 100 times better than of a human. So that's why pigs very often can smell out that you are not in such a good temper. Who knows what these are? Every pig has got them. Those are the scent glands. The scent glands of a pig are very important. They are very important right after birth because the scent of this gland is very attractive to the piglets. So this picture shows that. Because here you can see the piglets are all lying with the front legs where those glands are and are not lying on the back side of the pig where the heat is. You can see the heat lamp is there, not where they are lying. But they really prefer a little bit cold as to um, and or not lying with the scent glands. So this scent is also available commercially because it also calms even older pigs a little bit down. So in a stressful environment, this scent, which we humans cannot smell, is very important for pig communication. Pigs, like humans, are omnivores. And yes, Tina, also chicken are. So here we are. Hens, pigs, humans, and bears. We don't have bears. You do. I don't know, but I, I know from one of my brothers who makes many hiking trips here in Canada that sometimes the bear is also at the camper. Um, it must be because it's omnivorous. And this omnivorosity is uh, very good because a pig can survive on everything, but many times it likes some s tastes better than others. What a pig really likes is sweet, lemon candies. What it also likes is sour. That's lemon candies <laughs> double, yeah? That's why I did it, yeah? Sweet and sour. What they also like is salty, and what they also like, it, what they don't like is bitter. Bitter is always associated with danger. Everything that is bitter, Dear people, also beer. Yeah, beer is bitter too, but who remembers the first beer he drank? It, it, it was a bitter thing. Yeah, you might have to add a little bit Sprite to... I did. <laughs> I can remember it. Um, so, bitter they don't like. It's always danger, danger, danger. Many uh, oral medicines taste bitter. That's the reason why feed intake, when you medicate orally, is always a bit worse. And they like umami. And I al alre already mentioned umami, which is uh, the Japanese word for, um, you know, how do you say that in English? Um, like um, the taste of uh, meat, uh, a meaty soup, um, yeah, bouillon we say in, uh, in in Dutch, broth, yeah? And that umami taste is also there when there is blood, because also blood has that same umami taste. That's why pigs don't stop biting each other. What pigs really like, uh, you can see here at the left, that is uh, also beer. I have one customer in the Netherlands who is feeding the brewery what the brewery doesn't sell or which is close to selling date and those pigs they can ingest they are around 70 kilos they ingest beer to up to about six liters per day every day not one human can cope with that <laughs> and pigs do uh, i already said tina you have pigs and you have chicken uh, Mr. Brunberg, he did a research, you will know it. Uh, and we can put the pigs and chickens in these graphs when it is about uh, how to adapt to an environment, what happens when there is an environment which is not well enough for pigs. It more or less is the same for chicken, as you see. Yeah? Pigs and chicken in this respect 
are very comparable. So the research you will be doing on chicken will help pick, uh, will, will help the pig research and the other way around, with the exception of the toilet. I can't change that. <laughs> so pigs are very intelligent, but they have a rooting disc which uh, needs to be rewarded. And that rewarding of the rooting disc, I think, is one of the main problems we have in the current farm environments. The rooting disc of the pig is so full of nerves that it is an organ which uh, needs that stimulation. When it doesn't get that stimulation, there is a certain frustrative behavior which starts evolving. So I think we have to come up with apparatuses or something that we can really stimulate that uh, rooting disc. I do it in a simple way. I do it on my farm just by keeping them outdoor so they can make holes like they did last week almost of a meter deep. And I really don't know what they are after because they have enough food, they have enough water, but they really spend hours and hours rooting. Hours and hours. I think we have underestimated how big that desire for rooting is. This desire they uh, have, and uh, I, I would say these are uh, this one sow and one boar of mine. This is Bro, and Bro was born in uh, Canada, so um, I brought him over, and he's a happy guy now in uh, in Holland. And this reproduction, I would say, is very often it's a combination. It's a it's uh, an F1 cross or an F2 cross. And there, I would say the intelligence, the vitality of the offspring is determined by the genetics. And as you can see, the high lean meat deposition rate at the right. You see the Belgian Pietran. I am in Belgium too, because that's our neighbor country. And in Belgium, the purebred Pietran herds, they are almost impossible to manage. When they have 50 purebred Pietran sows, the farmer is completely full. He cannot do more because those animals are so double muscled or triple muscled that you really pamper them from birth till end. So we have to make sure that in genetics we are starting, and I think I know the genetic companies are. We are starting to use those genetics which bring more vitality, bring more intelligence, bring more coping uh, to, um, to the offspring. Tail docking, yes, I'm almost ready. Tail docking, the curly tail is a sign of feeling well. And we know that in my Berkshires, we also know that in white pigs. Curl needs to be in the tail. The curl moet in de staart zitten. And when we keep docking the tails, I think we are we are ignoring that we are doing are dealing with a very intelligent animal, which shows us far in advance how it feels. But you need to be able to see the signs. They are creative, as you can see here. Yeah, when you give them a brush, uh, they will start painting. And here, the research of our Stan Curtis, he showed that when you give a pig a joystick in his mouth, he will s is, he's able to see on the screen where the blue spots are, and he will push the joystick toward that blue spot, and then gets rewarded with an M&M. Yeah, not with a lemon candy, but with an M&M. That's how intelligent they are. A dog will never do that. He cannot do that. So in the end, I want to finish my talk with this saying from, uh, again, Animal Farm. The creatures looked outside. Uh, uh, creatures outside looked from pig to man and from man to pig and from pig to man again. But already it was impossible to say which was which. Thank you well. Yep.
So this is the, the basic book, the PIC signals basic book. Um, they are not new, but still pig farming has not changed that much. But what I try to do is in a very illustrative way to show how things are to be interpreted and how things are done. So uh, find them on the internet. Uh, I know they will ship them to Canada without a problem. It's all in English, but you can also have them in Japanese, Chinese, Korean, uh, Dutch, German, and so on and so on. So these are the, the theme editions for piglets, for sows, and for finishing pigs. So take a picture and enjoy the reading. Thank you. The burlap bag has its color because it's burlap. So uh, I've never seen any research on <coughs> different colors, but burlap, the, the texture of the burlap works out better than ropes or chains or balls on chains. Or uh, I was in the, in the far, farmer's pharmacy uh, with my uh, brother-in-law, and there they have those toys on a, on a chain which uh, um, which helps in in um, yeah in, in in preventing tail biting. I think the burlap bag is far better. So I think the farmers pharmacy needs to start selling burlap bags. I have a related question. How do you keep the burlap out of the pet? Oh, they will. They, they, you won't. You won't. Uh, but uh, the burlap bag needs to be uh, fixed well. On the on the on the pen uh, division or on the, on a uh, metal uh, pipe, and then uh, they will eat it and they will digest it. Maybe not, uh, but it will be in the feces. So uh, the burlap bag should not end up in the in the in the slurry pit. Okay. Yeah. So you need to fix it well because they st really start pulling uh, and uh, destroying it. Yep. Um, uh, what we did in the research, we tried to get the control group in a thermoneutral environment. So let's say they were uh, uh, finishing pigs, uh, 25 kilos. Uh, so we started at 24 degrees and we ended up at, at the end at about 20 degrees centigrade. And then in the, in the, in the test group, we exposed them to, to cold air, which was 5 degrees lower in temperature than the environmental temperature yeah, in that uh, same uh, range. And we increased the air speed to around 0.4 meter per second. And we know from the research that air speed in pig barns at the level of the pigs should not exceed 0.2 meter per second. That's a max. When it goes uh, higher than that, they will start showing that redirected explorative behavior, they will start to act funny. They, they are stressed out by that. And the, the huddling effect, it would, uh, it would minimize after about one hour after the cold air had stopped. Yeah? One last question, and then we'll take it over to the Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I will repeat the question. Sorry, I didn't do it last time. 
the question is, uh, did you do any research on the, the form of the, 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 the shape of the pen? Uh, long or wide, uh, large groups, small groups? Uh, we know from experience with um, not too large group, let's say up to 25 figs in a pen, that the longer pens, the longer narrow pens are the best because a pig likes, likes to have different uh, function areas. So the function of uh, defecating, urinating, it likes to have it separate from where it lies and where it eats and drinks. So in a long pen, it is easier to make those different areas than in a wide, uh, not so deep pen. You know what I mean? So the longer pens are the, for a pig, are the more logic pens. So what you will always see that the, when the pen is long, they will start using a corner to defecate. Yeah, they'll stand in the corner. They will urinate there. That's where, and most often, that is the area where there's a bit higher airspeed, the not so comfortable area to lie down. And then they will start lying in a more comfortable area. And there you should not have your drinker or your feeder because then all the, you get constant disturbing uh, pigs each other. So the longer narrow pens are the better. And the real large groups like you have here in Canada with the, with the um, sorting systems, we don't see them that much in uh, Europe. So I, I, yeah, I see that it works because they have more, yeah, roaming uh, possibilities, but uh, I can't give good advice on that. Well, thank you very much. Please join us. We have coffee and treats over at OEC.